little bit early. Hello? I'm, I said you're early. I'm early. Yeah. I'm just yeah. getting ready. Okay. Trying to beat Jack. Good morning. Welcome all y'all here this morning. Uh, if you've got a bulletin, I want to get you to make note of the inside page. It's got all the announcements. I'm going to go through it kind of a little bit quick, and i got a couple to add. We have our men's prayer service that uh, we do on Thursday nights at 7, that we meet right up here. I want to invite all the men to come to that. Also, make note of the community breakfast we do at the first of the month. So that's not till April, but April 1st and 2nd. Uh, we'll do the uh, community breakfast and grow on Saturday, and then we'll have community breakfast on Sunday before church. Also, uh, on Sunday nights, we have our Southern Gospel Music with the Pilgrims. They do it every, four, every Sunday. Well, it's really Sunday afternoon, 430. So uh, that's up here. Uh, you're welcome to come to that Sunday night. Also, a couple other announcements. Uh, Church conference is after church today, a little short, uh, normal three-month uh, business meeting we have. We'll do that. That won't last very long. Uh, also, uh, youth camp. I do have a youth camp date. It's going to be June, June 12th through 17th. It's week two of youth camp. So if you know any kids that uh, want to go that's uh, going into the seventh grade for next year and up, that they can go uh, just get with me. I'm still, I don't have everything completed yet, but here, hopefully by tomorrow, I'll get the last bit of the information from the camp and I'll have it where I can put it online. It'll be, I'm looking at doing the online registration where there'll be a QR code for those y'all don't know what that is, a little square box with little dots and junk on it. Anyway, it, it's what you do is you just, you kind of get your phone out Put, you know, you can use your camera and it'll take you to where you need to go to register. We're going to try that this year. It worked real good for other churches that I talked to. And uh, something else I want to mention, a former pastor at our church, uh, Brother Dwayne Turner, his wife, Charlotte, passed away. Uh, some, I imagine a lot of y'all maybe don't know her, but some of you do. Just want to let y'all know, uh, Rhonda told me she's looking up the info on the services and all. If you need to know anything about that, she said get with her and she would find out all that information. So anyway, with that said, I don't know of any other announcements. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. 
Father, I want to thank you for this time again that we come into your house. Father, just pray that you just uh, take this time right now to help us to focus in on you, Father, to, to get into the worship, to realize it's all about you. Father, just continue to help and guide us in all we do. Give Brother Dudley the words that we need to hear, Father, but help our hearts just to be open and be responsive to what you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
You may be seated. Hello. Oh, thank you, Mount Olive Worship Group. It is truly a blessing to hear them every week, every week. Uh, my wife is still back working. The, apparently somebody deleted the soundboard, all the software um, on Wednesday night rehearsal. So they, they had to go and she does the, the sound booth there. I, I did not realize how much there really is to that. Uh, do you, you, you have no idea how many switches those guys have to monitor and, and, and sound things and, and such that uh, you, you just take it for granted. And the best way to know it is if you never actually have to worry about it. And, and here at, at Mount Olive, you've never worried about the sound. It's always, it's always been fixed. And we're very grateful for the gentlemen that work back there. Uh, okay. It is an honor to be with you today. Um, today is spring break. It's all in. Um, we are in Texas, what we call the pollination season. Um, um, and today uh, we, we lose an hour, so Raymond will keep an update if anybody comes wandering in with a really odd look on their face at the invitation time. Um, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all doing well, making, I hope you're all taking care of each other. Taking care of each other. Uh, it's important that we take care of each other. Uh, that we love each other as Christians as Christ commanded us to do. That's a family of faith, and that's what God called us to do. Um, it's often said that we need to remember that God did not save us for our own spiritual convenience. Uh, a lot of people like to see the churches as today, what can I, what, what does that church have, what program do they have that fits our needs, and they'll, they'll pick that, hey, you ever think about what you can do here? Uh, churches need to, Christians need to go back to thinking of their churches as places for them to serve, not necessarily to be served. Now, we do serve each other. We do look out for each other, but we need to be thinking about that. Um, I want to follow up with you guys on uh, the message I gave, not last time, but the, the, the time before that. And I got to tell you, today's message is a little bit more serious than I'd like to. So, I guess I should do this. I would like to begin with just a little bit of brevity because this is pretty serious, okay? So this is, this is pretty, pretty serious. Um, did you hear about the two peanuts that were walking down the street? One of them was assaulted. Okay, all right, there. A little bit of brevity before we get into the very serious part. Um, okay. In Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, um, I know this is, yeah, any book that begins with the Lamentations uh, is, this, is written by the prophet Jeremiah. Um, and um, he said to you, he said at the end, 3, 22 through 23, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassion never fails. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I love that verse. I love that verse. The, I realize now that the world does not have that verse. The world has no understanding of that. That, that God's forgiveness is new for us every morning. His mercy is new every morning. And when you mess up, he forgave you. And you start over. 
And you don't have to keep going back to the same mess over and over and over and over again. You, you realize how many relationships and families and lives and careers and people are destroyed because they are feeling guilty over what they did a long time ago? We, they don't have that. And the world does not have such a promise, but we do. But I want to expand a bit on the guy that wrote that. Uh, he is the prophet Jeremiah. He's also known as the weeping prophet. Uh, a little bit of biblical history here. Uh, Jeremiah is the prophet that was in Jerusalem at the time of the fall uh, when the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. And he was given this job, he was called to the prophet in around, somewhere around, we think, 626 B.C., around the age of 17, which is, you know, the age of some of you here. Um, and he was basically called to be a prophet over the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I want you all to think about that real quick, because... As we talk about destruction, as we talk about seeing the, the, the land of Israel destroyed, as we talk about seeing what happened, he knew this was what he was going to be prophesying to. A time of destruction. He knew that they would be conquered. God told him that this land would be conquered and plundered and it would be carried away. Now, the strange fate about this, and, and this is what, you, what we oftentimes forget to consider, that the fate of Israel, the fate of Judah, was sealed a few generations earlier when the evil king Manasseh was doing things that our own Hollywood producers would have trouble dreaming up. That... They were performing their own, sacrificing their own children. They were doing all kinds of depraved things, all kinds of evil things. And God declared that that's it. I am going to enact judgment upon you. I am going to carry you off. Now, it's not like, you know, you think about, well, we, we have trouble relating to this today, but this is the worship of Yahweh. This is the worship of Almighty God. This is the only place in the world that he's really worshiped there at the time. It's not like you could, you know, well, if things fold up here, we can always go to another church down the road. We can move somewhere else. This is it. This is who's going to, this is it. You're going to be destroyed. You're going to be carried off into exile because you were entrusted with being God's people on this earth and you time and time and time again failed to do that. And you went after other gods and you did things. And, and one of the things that the Bible is very good about doing is not glamorizing the practices of the pagan world. In fact, not even really letting you know, if you want to go digging and find out what that was really like, you may. We will not be doing that here. Just take it for granted. It was pretty, pretty bad. And no one listened. Now, there was a reform under King Hezekiah, and he bought him a few more years. there really is no great return of the nation to following God. There's no great return to really seeing what is evil amongst you and saying, you know what? Don't do that. Don't do that. And no way to re no, restore the worship of God. The people wanted to worship the Baals. They wanted to worship the stars. They wanted to worship the Asherahs. They wanted to, to the mystery religion, the fertility cults. In short, guess what? They wanted to be accepted by the world and the nations around them rather than be accepted and be obedient to God. They tried to merge them all into this kind of amalgamation of all the world views and it did not please God. They wanted to make everyone feel welcome. Forget holiness. 
Forget obedience. Forget our covenant. Forget what our promises. Forget where your real source of power comes from. We just want to be like everybody else. Instead, they got neither. They lost the blessings of God. They were soon hated and despised by the people who hated them for serving God in the first place. They saw Israel, half, the ten kingdoms, hold off, dispersed amongst the, the Mesopotamian countries. They saw their empire, or the land God had given them, gradually decline. And they still had memories of times where Solomon and David were king, and they still had it on record when we could raise an army of hundreds of thousands if we wanted to, that no one could stand against us. When Joab was commander of the army, no one ever defeated them. The wealth would pour into the country like you wouldn't believe. The art, the religion, the music, the culture, the building program. Everything was given to them. And God said, if you'd wanted more, I would have given it to you. Yet they forgot. Folks, if you want to see where I'm going with this, and you want to correlate this with Christians living in America today, we're kind of on the same page here. We're on the same page here. You see, our culture is in decline. You see, we are witnessing a world that has turned its back on God. But back to Jeremiah. He saw the Assyrians destroy Israel. He saw them carried off. And they were known for their cruelty. And he now is beginning to see the Babylonians now at the gate. He is seeing them building siege works. He is seeing them tell them, we are going to defeat you. No one has saved you us. If you've ever seen, and I don't want to reference this too much, but if you've ever seen uh, uh, the, the, the movie The 300, what the, the Persians, and this is the same group of people that is now coming through. And he's seeing them. And he knows what their plans are. And he knows what they're going to do. And he knows what God has told them that they are going to do. And he looks into his kingdom and he sees people starving. Um, he sees in, in, in Lamentations 4.10, with their own hands, they, they practice cannibalism. Or excuse me, Lamentations 4.10. And if you want to read this, I encourage you to do so, but I'm not because we've got kids here. Um, And now look at them. They're starving. They're hungry. They have no one else to turn to. Everything along the way God spoke to them was called for two things. He just called for two things. Repentance and obedience. Repentance and obedience. Turn away from your sin. Do what I ask you to do. It will go well for you. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? I've provided for you four. I brought you up out of Egypt. I saw miracles where the sea was parted and you crossed on dry land. I brought you into the desert for years and years and years and, and brought you manna from heaven. Have any of you ever been to the desert? Have you ever really? I mean, it's hard enough to find a Dairy Queen still functioning in the desert. Much less having food descend from heaven water out of nowhere when you needed it your shoes never wore out you were protected against everybody and every time they needed to and every time they sinned and every time they turned to the bales and all they had to do was repent and obey and god was quick to deliver them and everywhere along the way god spoke and called for this and he told them one message, Jeremiah told them one message. Don't fight this judgment. Surrender to the Babylonians. Do not rebel. I will show you what to do. They went up to fight. 
They went out to fight with whatever left army that they had, the resources that they had. And the army was soon defeated and routed and fled in all directions, but they were overtaken. And the king of, Ju of, of Israel, or king of Judah, was soon subdued on the plains trying to make it to Arab, to the Arab world. And he was carried away in bronze and chains. And he had all his children killed in front of him. And he had his eyes knocked out. And then, you know what they did? You know what the people did at that point? Nebuchadnezzar put a, a vassal king in charge, said a governor took, his, took all the people away. And while he was there, uh, some troublemakers from another tribe came over and assassinated the leader. Well, now you've really done it mad. You've assaulted the world empire after you've been conquered, after you've been let off, and now you've done it one more time. Reminds me of when I used to wrestle with my little brother. I'd let him up, and he'd sucker punch me in the back as soon as I turned around. They'd done this, and now they've ascended one of the world's superpowers of the day, and they were left with this promise, this, this, this dilemma. Should we go to Egypt? Should we go to Egypt? Let's run. Let's get out of here. And Jeremiah reminded them, he said, look, don't go to Egypt. Whatever you do, don't go to Egypt. Stay here. I will take care of you. I will be, be with you. Um, in uh, Jeremiah 42, um, 9 through 12. And look at this. Oh, by the way, they went to Jeremiah. And they said, Jeremiah, now you're the prophet of God who's told us all this stuff, who told us everything that was going to happen to us, just before it happened to us, by the way. Not, not to mention that he's true. And they falsely accused him. He had had a career of being beaten, of having rocks thrown at him. He had been confined. He had been kidnapped several times. He had even had been thrown into a well and a cistern and forgotten about and was rescued by someone putting uh, ropes and rags around him and it took a team of people to pull him out just in the nick of time as the water had gone over his head. And now the people come to him and say, what do you want us to do? What should we do? Yet no one listened. And in verse 9, uh, chapter 4, uh, if you'll flip over to Jeremiah 42, verses 9 to 12. They asked him, Jeremiah, if you'll just tell us what to do, we'll do it. We promise you, we'll do it. We promise this time. And he said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your petition says, if you stay in this land, I will build you up. I will not tear you down. I will plant you and not uproot you. For I have relented concerning the disaster I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you now fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord. For I am with you. I will save you and I will deliver you from his hands. I will show you compassion so that he will have compassion on you and restore you to your land. Do you know that verse was in there? All the judgment that had been prepared and coming was now on its way and was now happening to them and was going on and all the horrors in the midst of it. And by the way, being conquered by a, a Mesopotamian country is not a place you really want to be in. Okay. And God said, hey, look, if you'll obey me, I'll take care of this for you. If you will repent, I will relent. And do you know what the people said? Of course, they said, well, all right, then we'll, we'll, we'll do whatever you say this time. No, they said, you're a liar. And they took off to Egypt and they all died. But had that moment happened, had the people repented, had the people obeyed, Solomon's temple would probably still be standing today. And the people would not have had to endure 70 years of exile. 
yet no one listens. Now, I don't know where you are right now, but we all know that we serve a holy and awesome God. We know that if he didn't spare his own son, that the judgments that we have coming for us are probably pretty real. But all God wants from us is relent as a repentance and obedience. Repentance and obedience. And even in the face of the upcoming judgments, God will forgive you. God will restore you. God will build you up. God will take care of you. It is not a condition of debts being paid. It is a condition of our obedience to our Heavenly Father. And I want to cross-reference this too to back to our, our Lamentations chapter because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning and even in our country and our society and in our world and in your life and in my life in the shape that it is in. When we turn to God, He is there to restore us. And he is there to build us up. And I don't care who you voted for. I don't care what you did. I really don't care what's going on. In that matter, it's irrelevant. Have we turned our hearts towards God? Are the people of God obeying him? Are the people of God doing what he'd have us to do? Even in the face of his judgment, God will restore us. God has relented and he relents when we repent. And he builds us up to protect us. And he will build us up to establish us again. And he will provide for us and he will take care of you. And he will love you. And he will see to it that you will have everything that you need. And he will bless you beyond measure. Let's pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, you are God. And Lord, we pray for our country, and we pray for our land, we pray for our society, Lord. We see so much evil going on around us. We know that you are waiting there for us. And that all the horrible things that we see coming for us, we know that you are also a merciful God. Lord, we want to be your servants. And we want to do your will. And Lord, we give it to you. For we ask these things in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. If you want to make this the day where you relent or you repent and obey and you bring it to God, if you will come forward and sing or if you have something you need prayer about, the altar is always open up here and we will pray with you and we will see that God gives you what he needs, what you need. Came sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing.
blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, who rescued for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. seated. I know we're supposed to have a, a conference. You know where Jack is? Or John? <laughs> Jack or John? <laughs>